This episode of The Candid Frame is sponsored by the Charcoal Book Club. Working with the most respected names in contemporary photography, Charcoal selects and delivers essential photo books to a worldwide community of collectors. Each month, members receive a signed first edition monograph and an exclusive print to add to their collections. Join the club by visiting charcoalbookclub.com and use the promo code the candid frame at checkout and receive a 10% discount on your first membership payment. We also have the support of lensrentals.com, the largest online camera rental house in the US. They carry the most popular brands and models of cameras, lenses, and anything you need for video, lighting, post-processing, and more. Whether you need something for a one-time assignment or want to test it out before you buy, LensRentals.com is there to help. Explore their extensive inventory and save 10% on your first order when you sign up for their newsletter at LensRentals.com forward slash newsletter. When putting together a resume, a rule of thumb is to limit it to just a single page. Today's guest, Nathan Mervold, would have an impossible time doing that if he had to, which he doesn't. Along with being the former chief technology officer for Microsoft and the co-founder of his own company, Intellectual Ventures, he is also the co-inventor of over 900 U.S. patents issued to his corporation and its affiliates. However, it's his passion for food that led him to earn a culinary diploma in France and eventually become the principal author and photographer for his books on cooking, beginning with the modernist cuisine, the art of science and cooking. Through his efforts, he reimagined what food photography was and could be and led to amazing innovations in approach and technology. He brings together science, artistry, imagination, and good food in a way that only he can deliver. This is Ibadi and X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Thank you so much for making time for me. I'm glad we are finally able to make this happen. Yep. I've really enjoyed your work and finding out more about it, man. You sometimes I think I'm busy and I just look at the <laughs> litany of things that you're doing going, man, I'm a I'm a schlub compared to this guy. <laughs> but there's a lot to talk about with you. So what one of the things that I, I'm kind of wanna start with is that when I talk to photographers of a certain generation, you know, I ask about, you know, sort of the moment where photography where became this like life-changing moment and it usually revolves around you know the darkroom experience about seeing that image appearing in a in, mm -hmm. a, in, a, in a in a developing tray but food is a big thing for you as well and one of the things that i'm curious about is do you have the equivalent of that kind of moment when it came to food oh sure you know both food and photography were very early interests of mine when I was nine years old, I told my mom I was going to cook Thanksgiving dinner all by myself. Mm -hmm. And I got all these cookbooks from the library and I went shopping and, uh, and, and made the stuff. And then soon after that, I got a um, first an old like brownie camera and then a little bit better, more recent plastic and stomatic camera. And then finally, I went to a Salvation Army thrift store and I bought a Contax rangefinder, which was the state of the art camera in 1936 when it came out. Mm. <laughs> but, but this was probably, I don't know, 1968, 69. So it was a little long on the tooth, but it worked and it was a real camera. You know, it had decent lenses and everything else. And I soon was uh, developing uh, film and uh, making prints at home. I, I set up, I, there was a bathroom we never used that I painted black. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and your mom didn't mind that, I'm sure. <laughs> My mom was long suffering in this regard, yes. <laughs> I have a funny story about, about the, the painting of walls in college. Uh, I lived in a co-op, Stebbins Hall, in, located in North Berkeley. And the room next to me was, uh, there was... About 62 people, uh, maybe 24 to 30 rooms. Mm 
you know, and once you had lived there long enough, you'd get a room by yourself. But for the most part, your first couple of years there, you were sharing a yeah. room. And this young lady had the smallest room, which was actually supposed to be shared by two people. But for whatever, for whatever reason, that particular semester, she had it by herself. And she was also legally blind. She could see, but the screen had to be magnified significantly for her to be able to read yeah. text. You know, every time you got a room, you were free to paint it. She painted it dark purple with black trim. And it was like, <laughs> and you walked in that room that already was physically small already. Yeah. And then you, it was even felt smaller with those really dark colors. And sure. I thought to myself, hmm, there should be a rule that someone who's legally blind probably shouldn't be painting their own rooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, next, yeah. But see, then next you got to go after the color blind, right? <laughs> 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 so so when you wanted to cook that Thanksgiving dinner, what was it about the process that fascinated you? Was it just about the dynamics of what was happening in the kim you know, in the kitchen, you know, with your mom and maybe with other relatives or, or what was it exactly that captivated your imagination? Well, my grandmother had shown me how to make some stuff. I remember the first time she made bread with mm -hmm. me, which seemed just amazing because you have this white powder that's nothing like bread yeah, <laughs> and the yeast and water and so forth. And you add it together and the damn thing becomes alive and starts rising up and then you bake it and it's this incredible, delicious bread. So I thought that was a pretty magical transformation. One of the things that prompted that Thanksgiving dinner was that I'd found cookbooks at the library and I got this notion of like, Hey, this isn't like, you have to be grandma and learned all of this ages ago. I can like read a book and figure this out. And so that was part of the fascination. It was not, I was nine. And one of the books that I got from the library was called the pyromaniacs cookbook. And it was about cooking things flambe. And so the idea of pouring burning liquid over things at the table was really attractive to a nine year old kid. <laughs> oh man. I can already see your mother running to a counselor. And going, can we increase our sessions to twice a week? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so your mind was always, it wasn't just about the activity. It was always, it seemed to be, it was like you wanted to understand and figure out why it works. Yes. Yes, that's that's me. Yeah. You know, the, a classic recipe says you do this, you do this, you do this, and you get a result. And that is satisfying to some people, but it isn't that satisfying to me. And of course, if you only want to make that recipe, the recipe approach is fine. You don't need to know why, just do it. Mm -hmm. But if you want to create something new, or if you just like figuring stuff out, you want to know why it works. And the same thing was true with, with photography. You know, the, I really wanted to know why it worked and how it worked and how I could learn to take really great pictures. And some part of that is about artistic considerations, but it's also very enabled by technology. Photography is particularly that way because, you know, with a, I don't know, pencil and a paper, you can draw and you can draw pretty much anything. But for photography, there are some shots that if you don't master the technology of the camera, you're just never going to get that shot. Right. And I, I, I think for some people that might be a barrier. Uh, maybe if I was just purely creative, it would have been a barrier. But I also did like the nerdy aspect of how all this stuff worked. And so, so I, photography appealed to me that way. There are a lot of people who, who come to photography with a similar mindset as to you. They're fascinated by the technological process of understanding how this camera works and how light and film or a digital sensor and how all that translates into, into a photograph. But some people just get s stuck there and they're never really able to tap into the creative part of themselves. And it's not that it's not there, but it seems like there's this wall that yeah. stands between, okay, I've got all the technology and now it's time to be creative and I don't know where to go. How, how are you able to some, you know, surmount that, that particular point in your development? Um, well, of course, I don't really know how I did. 
I, I was mostly self-taught, but at one point I decided I would take a, a, a professional workshop, you know, where they had, you, you worked with a very serious photographer and, you know, a bunch mm-hmm. of people got together and we would go out and take pictures together and they'll look at the pictures. And, and of course the, the guy who taught the class later said that he had me pegged for exactly the kind of person who was a total gear nut and couldn't take a picture that was worth looking at. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought that's what I was going to be. <laughs> But then when we had our first slideshow and I showed my pictures back in the film era, I showed my pictures. He was shocked (laughs) that I actually did have some, some amount of photographic ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the, the thing that there's some photographs that happen in the moment, um, photojournalists, those powerful photojournalism things often are about a, very emotional or a very evocative moment. But mostly in photography, you succeed. And in fact, even in photojournalism, you succeed by being prepared for those moments and to one degree or another planning those moments. And the plan doesn't always work in the sense that you might think, oh, I'm going to take a portrait of you. I'm going to light it this way. It's the way I always light portraits. And then halfway through the session, you know, when the lights goes out, you think, oh, shit, this is better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so you always have to be open to going in a different direction, but it helps if you're able to pre-visualize and have some idea of what you're looking for. Just uh, last week, I was uh, in the Southwest, and I went to a slot canyon for the first time. And a slot canyon is uh, a canyon that is very deep. It's The one I was in was about 200 feet deep. But in spots, it was only like two feet wide. It looks slide through it. Yeah. And I've seen lots of other pictures that people had taken of slot canyons. And I had a great time taking pictures, but it was my first time taking pictures of a slot canyon. And I really wanted to see how they all turned out because I, 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 it was the first time I had experienced that kind of visual thing. And I, I wasn't sure what I was, should be taking. I wasn't sure what I wanted to take. Mm-hmm. But when you're new to a subject, <laughs> that's often what happens. Now, the great thing today about digital photography is that you're able to go from being new to a subject to take a picture and see pretty quickly if what you got is is what you want. It also helps uh, I, composing with the screen on the back of the camera can sometimes help you see a shot that you wouldn't see if you're looking with your eye because your eye is darting around and you're not tending to see the whole thing all at once. But I think mostly you've just got to be open to really creative ideas and different ways of doing things. And then you also have to be open to taking a lot of bad pictures. Oh, yeah. Um, And it sounds funny. But (laughs) if you're, if you said, when I was uh, in high school, I got a large format camera, a uh, five by seven Deerdorf. And I learned to take pictures of that. And I I was okay with it. But the more you, time and energy and money you invest in doing a setup with a cumbersome camera like that, the less likely you are to try something radical and cool, I, I find. And so, so you know, being willing to, you know, I took part way through this slot kitten experience last week. I said, well, okay, I may shoot nothing is worth anything at all, but I'm going to try and I'm, I'll try lots of different things and maybe i can connect with something that then really i resonate with afterwards yeah and you just in moments like that because i've experienced that countless times and and for me one of the things i've learned is just like i just need to be present in the moment and experiencing it and enjoying it and if 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 all my energy is is on oh i have to come back with a good photograph more than likely i'm just going to come home with crap just because i'm preoccupied yeah. with the wrong thing. I'm not I'm not focused on seeing, experiencing and being in the moment. I'm being a slave to what I think the camera is going to do or not do. And it's easy to fall into that, right? Because you yeah. have an assignment or you really want to get that shot of this thing or I'm only there for one day and all of those things pile up. Then equipment can also get in the way of like, oh, you know, god damn it, the camera's acting up or I I don't know how to use this one weird mode or God knows what. And the more you focus on those things, the less you're going to be able to see. Now, the flip side is what I love about photography is it forces you to have discipline to see things. You know, when you go somewhere, look at anything, it's like, oh, yeah, okay, fine. I looked around. 
and and you'd leave it at that mm -hmm. but you know you can't make a good photograph that way because a great photograph is about not just a glance it's about all of the elements that are going to be what's left there you know your photography is a process of taking a scene and then abstracting out of it this thing that you call a photograph exactly still is very different than video that way you want that thing you know uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson called it his decisive moment. Now, that guy had to be present and in the moment all the time for those mm -hmm. things to happen. And, and frankly, that would also be, a, until you got used to it, it would be a pretty tiring thing to do. But I think it is the great advantage of being somewhere and wanting to take a, a – being in a photographic mindset about a place means you look at it in a way more detailed fashion. And – to me, that's kind of cool. Yeah, you you mentioned Slot Canyon, and a good there a good amount of your work involves um, landscape. Tell me about you know your way of thinking because with the food photography, you get very inventive in terms of how the process in which you make a photograph. But but tell me how your experiences in terms of landscape sort of helped you to develop the way that you you see and the way you wield the camera. Well, there's very different problems that you have to solve you know with food food photography in general has been dominated in the past by advertising or commercial food you know food that a picture of food that goes behind the counter at the fast food place that wonderful juicy burger they never actually mm -hmm. give you <laughs> yeah. or or ads or editorial use where usually the food is secondary you know, in a Thanksgiving, we're about to have Thanksgiving, there'll be a zillion magazine covers that have a turkey with all the fixings. That isn't really a food picture. That's a Thanksgiving holiday stereotype picture. <laughs> right. And, and it's supposed to be. That's you know, like, that's, that's okay. Historically, very few really artistic photographers worked with food. Um, it wasn't zero. Edward Weston has this incredible picture pepper number 30 of a green pepper. Uh, and he took lots of other food photos besides that, but that one is just so iconic. Um, Irving Penn took a lot of food photos, but that wasn't the mainstream of their existence. And so uh, with food, thinking in a different way than everybody else, I don't want to say it's easy, but uh, you know, the way that we try to portray food has got some combination of a didactic goal because I write cookbooks, and so you want to have things that illustrate a teaching moment of how the food is prepared, right. but also just something unique, because we all see food multiple times a day, or we wouldn't live. But again, do we really look at it? It's like I was saying, the discipline of really looking. And mm -hmm. that's where I find if you are creative, you can show people a vision of something familiar that's still very different. Um, with landscape, I try to do the same thing. Now, that's more difficult because I think the scope of landscape photography has been much wider than the scope of food photography in just in the past, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It, it's, it's much harder to come up with things that are interesting and unique, but you still can. I, I haven't done a lot of work with drones, but I, I bought a drone and I've tried doing a bunch of it. I've done aerial photography in the past, but aerial photography where you're there is quite different than a drone because the drone can go places that are too dangerous or you're too low to the ground or a bunch of other stuff. Another thing I like doing is showing people landscapes that may not be the conventionally beautiful landscape, but they're about something important to them. So an example is what I call food landscapes. So the landscapes where food is grown you know, most of us experience food in plastic little cartons at the <laughs> grocery store. It's already packaged up. And so I, I, I've got one series of things called, I call unknown foods. So here's an example of an unknown food. Uh, at least a billion people will have a beer today. Almost none of them knows what hops looks like. And yeah. it turns out hops is a bizarre plant. It's a vine that grows 18 feet tall, and it, it looks kind of crazy. Now, fortunately the largest hop growing area in the United States and, and one of the largest in the world is like two hours from me <laughs> here in oh, Seattle, nice. just in Eastern Washington. So I've gone over and done a bunch of pictures of hops and people will say, well, why? But then when you explain, Hey, there's the thing you experience as beer 
or you know here's here's what wheat fields look like in different things it's a little more familiar than beer but still it's yeah. uh it's unusual you talked earlier about commercial food photography it was largely about marketing and promoting a product you know be it the food itself yeah, is- or the utensils that make the food so th- th- it, that's the intention so when you started getting really into photographing food what was your intention what what was your goal with the photography well, that you started to do i wanted to show people food a vision of food they'd never seen before sometimes some of my pictures they have a didactic component where i want to teach something mostly it's about showing them something that's a view they had never seen now it could be never seen because it just never looked that close it could be because i'm using a microscope or a, a macro outfit and i'm looking at a magnification that they're unfamiliar with. Uh, Or it could be I'm using high-speed photography to photograph something that happens too quickly for the human eye. Another class of things, um, I took a bunch of star uh, trail pictures in a uh, vineyard. And a star trail is where you have a very long exposure. And as the earth turns, the stars make circles. And the center of the circle is the north It's called the celestial pole, but it's the star Polaris, basically. Mm. So you see all these circles. Now, that's something that most people are familiar with. Of course, the Earth rotates, but this process happens too slowly. So you have to use a very slow shutter speed. The the same thing is true with a bunch of shots of motion. Something that's normally moving, a, a raging river looks very different as you slow the shutter speed down. So in these things, I sometimes will have a specific goal, and sometimes I just want to say, what can I do with this thing? And you scratch your head, and you try some stuff, and you try some more stuff, and then hopefully it works. But I I didn't have a goal of saying I'm trying to make the perfect Thanksgiving turkey for a a magazine article, or I'm trying to sell this hamburger, or whatever. Um, uh, We never use food stylists, which is part of that. Now, I have nothing against food stylists, but if I hired a great food stylist to do my, to style my food, that's a large part of what I think should be my job. You know, I've got a a sequence of pictures that are about heirloom varieties of things that aren't perfect. Um, I've got one called uh, real tomatoes have curves (laughs) And, (laughs) and they do. Okay. But In that picture, there's nothing technique-wise. I wouldn't say, oh, this is like some miracle new technique, but it's about really photographing that thing on a plain background where it is so front and center. It's it's the equivalent of having a picture of somebody at rest, which is what most food is, versus a picture where someone is looking you in the eye. And it's a different – now, obviously, there's no eyes, but that tomato is present, and that tomato is unabashedly – getting its picture taken uh, as opposed to, oh yeah, it's part of a overall scene where I've got the tomatoes on the cutting board and I've got the nice knife and I have the, the right doilies on the, the table. And it, it, there's nothing wrong with all of that except that it dilutes the tomato. Yeah. It seems like what you're going for is a, a genuine, a, a genuine, a genuine, a yeah, genuine rendering of of the subject. In this case, it's tomato, rather than an idealized representation of. That's right. Um, a, another thing we do a lot is y- in food. You have you put stuff together, right? That's a good part of what cooking is. And when I was a kid, I uh, worked on my mother's car, and uh, I had these Chilton repair manuals. Oh, and I remember They those, had yeah. something called. An, they had something called an expanded, uh, exploded diagram. So you have a part like a uh, muffler or a uh, carburetor, and it would be sitting there, but then it would be taken apart and floating in air, and you could see how everything went together. Mm-hmm. And one picture would show you all of that. Well, uh, when it, we came to describing sandwiches in one of my books, I thought, hey, let's do an exploded diagram, but we'll do it photographically. And of course, we could have done an illustration, but there's something about the reality of a photo that's very compelling. Uh, So we have this impossible shot of, you know, two pieces of bread floating and each layer in between floating. And it shows you how the sandwich goes together. Yeah. 
but it's also kind of beautiful and kind of like, oh my God, how did they do that? And so it engages people way more than an illustration would have. I, I just finished a book on pizza. And so that's how we did the instructions for assembling pizzas. So in those shots, you see a the disc of the dough that's all flattened. Then floating above that is a layer of sauce and floating above that is cheese and maybe pepperoni slices. And it's a combination of people saying, well, my God, how did they take that picture? And ooh, isn't that cool? But also in an instant, you've shown them, this is how that uh, pizza goes together. I love that. I love that picture of the sandwich. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh, wow. And I asked myself, that's the very same question. How, I, first, I was amazed by just the beauty of the picture and go, how do you do that? So what, what were some of the challenges that you faced in making that kind of shot happen? Well, so the thing that makes that picture work is first that everything is floating without obvious support. Second, that the perspective is right. Partially to get the perspective right, I shot those little wider lens than I might otherwise. You have a little bit of things where, you know, one one level you're seeing the bottom of the burger and the other level you're seeing the top of something else mm -hmm. because of perspective. Now, to get that right, you have to put them all in the right positions. And over time, we've developed two or three different ways of doing that. One is to set it up and measure it, and then you shoot each layer at a time where the layer is supported by some supports that you can hide in the picture. My very first ones, we would have a black background, which I thought was kind of cool. But then I thought, wouldn't it look even cooler if it's floating in your kitchen? And so that's what we tend to do now is ones where you can see right through and there's out of focus, but there's a kitchen and everything else all around. Then those pictures made me say, hey, let's, well, we, we wanted to explain what goes on inside your food while it cooks. Because, of course, stuff is happening. And you could explain that in words, but it gets to be a lot of words, and that's a little off-putting for people. You know, my, my book describes the science of cooking, and science is taught in a way that turns many people off of science, or they think it'll be too complicated for them to understand or some other thing. So I wanted something that was visually compelling that would grab you and draw you in. So you see this picture, which, yes, it's got a pedagogical value in teaching you something, but it also is like, wow. And then you start reading little captions and little labels, and, and I've got you. I've got you hooked on the thing. Mm. Well, to show what goes on inside your food while it cooks, we had to cut it in half. Uh, and again, we could have done that with diagrams, but it's just so much better to cut pans in half and pots in half, and then eventually whole ovens and microwave ovens. You know, if you've ever wondered what's really inside your microwave oven, I've got a picture that, that shows that in a way that's both useful to the cookbook goal, but also tries to be a, a good looking picture of something that really is visually fascinating. How do you think that understanding the cooking process, not, in, not just in terms of the end result, but what's happening with all the ingredients and the utensil and the, you know, skillet, the pot, whatever you're using in order to cook it. How does understanding the science and the mechanics of it help you either as a cook and, or as a photographer when you're trying to do something creative with that very thing? Well, so that's, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's about the creative thing. If you've got a recipe that's a good recipe and you follow it, it's going to work. But here's a simple example. Suppose you're cooking steaks or something else that's a, you know, a, a flat plate of food, right? Uh, most steaks are parallel flat thing. Right. Well, if, suppose you've got the time all perfect for one that's an inch thick, but now you got at the store, you came home with steaks that are two inches thick. How much longer does it take? Now, it turns out there's a simple rule. And the, the rule is a fundamental part of heat conduction and the origins of that go into very deep science, but it, the time it takes for heat to reach the center of that steak will go like the square of the thickness. So that means if you double the thickness, it takes four times as long. Okay. And that is very useful if 
you know, company is coming over and you're just like, well, how come my steaks are raw in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if you have the two inch steak, yes, you can cook it. But now I'll tell you how to cook it. And then similar things happen for roasts and other stuff. And there's a bunch of rules like this that I don't think are too difficult to explain to people. But for one reason or another, they never have been explained to people. And most cookbook authors would, wouldn't know the answer to the two-inch thick steak. They'd go do some experiments, and they might figure it out. But they wouldn't know that, okay, there's a general rule that says this is what happens. You know, similarly, if you cut that steak, if you got extra thin steaks, well, they cook much faster. And you ought to know that because otherwise you'll overcook them. It's knowledge of that sort that's that's very helpful. And sometimes it's a very specific thing. I, uh, I was a judge on Top Chef uh, once, and that particular episode was set on a ranch in Texas. And people had to make barbecue, and they had to make beans. Um, yeah, you know, like baked beans. Well, everyone had rock hard beans, and they said, "Oh, I cooked it for hours." And the other judges were saying, "Well, you should have cooked it longer." Turns out that if you have highly mineralized water, okay, very hard water would be the uh, way to put it. In, but in particular, it has calcium and magnesium in it. That reacts with the skin and beans. Well, they were using well water from this well in Texas. If they had bought uh, bottled water, their beans would have been perfect. But as it happens, they were trying to cook it in this water where they would never be soft. Now, the flip side is, suppose you wanted to make beans for a bean salad. Well, there typically you don't want the beans to get mushy. So there, a little bit of calcium or magnesium salt in the water, and <laughs> you have... Uh, you know, nice hard kidney beans uh, for the salad that don't all mush up as it's stirred and served. That is fascinating. I mean, those are just a couple examples, but cooking is, I, I had one journalist uh, back on my first book come out and ask me, well, why did you think you had to bring science into the kitchen? And I said, well, science is already mm. in the kitchen. The laws of nature <laughs> work everywhere, including in the kitchen. And so my analogy is very much like buildings by Frank Geary. You know, Frank is this fantastic architect, and he makes these soaring, incredible buildings, like actually there's a great one in uh, Seattle or that museum in Bilbao. Well, you couldn't build those buildings if you didn't have enough structural engineering support to make them stand up. Okay? If they would fall over, that would be bad. Yeah, that'd be very problematic. Uh, in Egypt, there is a place called Giza where the main pyramids are. There's another place called Saqqara where they built pyramids also at a different age in Egypt. And there's a pyramid there called the Bent Pyramid. And the pyramid goes up at one angle, very steep, and then halfway up, it changes angle to much more shallow. And the reason is the Egy ancient Egyptians didn't have any theory. They didn't know structural engineering. And they initially built the damn thing too steep. And it was, there was no way they could have kept it going. Wow. Now, some poor guy had to come and say, uh, Pharaoh, we have news <laughs> about your pyramid. <laughs> you know, that, that whole shoot the messenger thing probably happened there. But, you know, the, the fact that they changed angle showed that they empirically figured it out just too late in the process. Well, wow. I'd rather empower people with that knowledge up front because somebody out there is going to use that. No, someone might just use it to compensate for one inch versus two inch thick steaks, you know, for a family meal, but somebody else may be a culinary Frank Geary that uses that to create some amazing dish. Photography can be about opportunities for building community, revolving around encouraging photographic work that makes a difference. That's what I love about the Curious Society, a member-supported nonprofit that has created an organization devoted to the work of today's best photojournalists and documentary photographers. If you have a passion for telling stories with photographs, you can start being a part of this community by becoming a member 
or joining in on their weekly hangouts on Clubhouse every Tuesday. Find out more by visiting their website at CuriousSociety.org. Our friends at the Charles Cole Book Club have just opened a call for entries for the 6th Annual Chico Hot Springs Portfolio Review and Publishing Prize. The Chico Review is a juried photo book retreat that takes place over a week in Chico Hot Springs in Montana. 64 photographers will be selected by a jury and invited to spend the week taking part in portfolio reviews, artist lectures, and panel discussions. And a grand prize winner will be awarded the Charles Cole Publishing Prize and have a book published through the Charles Cole Book Club. Find out more by visiting ChicoReview.com and remember the deadline is December 26th. LensRentals.com recently announced the launch of two purchase programs, Keeper and Keeper Test Drive, to enable the purchase of used equipment. Both programs are accessible via the Keeper page or the product page of equipment on LensRentals.com. The Keeper program allows you to purchase pre-owned inventory that has been refurbished, tested, and graded and priced by the sales team. All Lens Rentals pages now have the option to show product that are currently for sale through their Keepers program. Items are tested and rated for cosmetics, performance, and glass quality so you know exactly what you're getting. Keeper Test Drive enables users to rent equipment per the usual rental process and keep the gear if they like it by contacting the LensRentals.com team. Customers are offered a unique price for each item that's derived from the age and condition of the equipment they rented, with up to seven days of rental fees deducted from the overall price. Check out what they have to offer and save 10% on your first order when you sign up for their newsletter at LensRentals.com forward slash newsletter. And thanks to all of you who continue to support the Candor Frame financially. Your contributions, both big and small, make a massive difference for us. If you haven't become a Patreon supporter yet, it's easy to do. You can do it by just contributing $5, $10, or $20 or more by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. Just $5 a month from you makes a big difference. Thank you so much for your continued support. You talked earlier about adapting a microscope in order to get like a high magnification reproduction. Um, and I see yep. people can't see it uh, when they hear this episode, but there's a lot of equipment behind you. So it, it sounds to me that you've had to sort of invent or be or inventive in order to make certain shots happen. What's been one of the more challenge, one of the more challenging things that you had to come up with that you really enjoyed figuring out? Uh, well, I wanted to make a, um... I wanted to photograph snowflakes. Now, snowflakes are a very fragile subject. They start degrading the moment they fall. It, so rather than bring them inside your Microsoft, you have to bring your Microsoft outside to them. And there's been a bunch of people who've done snowflake microscopes before, but they had a whole variety of limitations. Uh, some of them were very kind in talking to me and explaining all of what they had done. And so I thought, okay, I'll build my own snowflake microscope. At that point, I built two or three other microscopes. So ah, how hard could it be? Well, it took 18 months. <laughs> wow. And it was hard because there were lots of pieces of the puzzle that I only became aware of as we worked. You know, So I think most people know that metal will c expand and contract with heat. Well, this is a problem because the amount of expansion or contraction that it does could ruin your shot. So I had to make most of the microscope out of carbon fiber. And then I wanted to get very high resolution. Well, it turns out that microscopes up to this point were designed for very, well, they were designed for film originally in your eyes. So they have a very small image circle. A typical microscope has about a 30 millimeter image circle. So that means it it has a hard, it won't cover 35 millimeter full frame even. And most scientific cameras just have a tiny sensor. Then you get lousy resolution. So um, it, then I do a lot of pictures with something called focus stacking, where you take, yes. mm -hmm. you, you have limited depth of field. So you take multiple pictures at different uh, depths of field, and then you combine them with software to make this one picture that's all sharp. 
Now, I like that because it's a semi, it, it was a heretofore impossible view. If you saw whatever the subject was at that magnification, you'd have extremely shallow depth of field. Depth of field, for example, that only might be a millimeter, a couple millimeters. And to some extent, we've gotten used to pictures like that. I wanted to make my uh, microscope camera uh, for snowflakes. I wanted to make sure that that could do focus stacking. Well, then I had to build this way of moving the whole thing by just tiny fractions of a micron. Human hair is about 100 microns. So you're moving it by a hundredth of a human hair at every point to take a picture. You have to be really careful that things don't. We we chill parts of the microscope to, to make the... A snowflake lasts longer, but if you chill it too cold, frost forms all over everything. And so that's a whole issue. And then finally, it turns out to get really good looking snowflakes. You have to go to some, and and have them stay long enough for you to photograph them. Right, because they're gone. Uh, You have to go someplace that's really cold. So most places in the U.S. are not reliably cold enough. So I have to go to Fairbanks, Alaska, or Yellowknife, Canada, um, Canada, or Timmins, Canada, um, very special places where it gets really cold, 15 below zero. And then I, what I try to do is I try to rent a hotel room or an Airbnb that has a balcony because I have to set up my microscope outside. <laughs> Um, oh, wow. But anyway, it was a long process. I got some good shots. I couldn't go back the next year because of COVID. This uh, winter, I'm going to go back and try to get some some more of the pictures. Well, that sounds fun. But uh, with that kind of temperature, this Latin boy is staying down here closer to the equator. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a lot of less exotic shots where we wind up building a camera or we adapt a lens um, there's some lenses from the past that are still better than lenses today. Um, or there's some very exotic lenses today that are used for semiconductor manufacturing other things, but it turns out you can adapt them to take pictures. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I love doing that kind of thing. It, it's hard because, you know, obviously it's way easier to just pick up a Canon or an Icon and it's all ready to go. Yeah. And whenever I can, I do believe me. <laughs> But if you get to a uh, point where you can't do it any other way, well, then you build something. Yeah. And what, probably one of the challenges to my thinking that you have to figure out as much as, as, much as how you're going to take the picture and, do, and what you're going to do with the file is lighting, you know, because each different product and each surface yep. and all that stuff is going to require completely different type of illumination. Tell, tell me about figuring that out in, in some cases. Well, of course, photography is about capturing light. Okay, light, light is our medium. Everything else is either the thing we bounce the light off of or the thing we catch the light with in the sensor or the, mm-hmm. the way we focus it. So light is hugely important. For different shots, it's, you've got a bunch of, of issues. For the snowflake shots, the problem is that snowflakes are clear, and so you need to do specialized lighting that can show what the structure is. Uh, and the techniques to do that were invented in the 19th century, uh, something called Reinberg illumination. But it's not easy to do, particularly across a wide field. It's, it's easy for narrow fields, but a wide field, which a snowflake turns out to be a wide field for, for this. In that case, I also needed to have my light very bright, but not have it on for very long, because the more it's on, the more it evaporates the snowflake. So I tried using Flash, and believe it or not, Flash was very hard to get to work. It, Flash was too slow. Too slow. Hmm. So I used LEDs, but I didn't use normal LEDs. Normal LEDs used for continuous lighting. But it turns out that if you build the right electronics, you can sit, treat a LED almost like a flash bulb, except it's better than a flash bulb. Most Flash... I, I've got some very special pro photo flashes here that'll go down to one sixty thousandth of a second. Okay. Okay, is so that sixty times faster than a millisecond? Well, my crazy 
LED flash thing that I, I found a company in Japan that made some of these components for an industrial purpose. And they wanted to know about my factory and I kept sort of stalling them. And finally I said, look, I take pictures of snowflakes. Okay. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it's, I'm not going to buy a thousand of these, but will you sell me one? Anyway, that, uh, that is flashes that are measured in a millionth of a second. A million. Wow. That's and quite a leap. Th- a one millionth. Okay. A thousandth of a thousandth. So in, in, like light is everything for that. Uh, you know, there's, there's actually a shot I have going on right now in another room <laughs> where uh, I'm trying to photograph uh, the formation of ice crystals. And I've got a camera and an aquarium in a blast uh, freezer. <laughs> and there, the challenge is the ice isn't very interesting unless you use cross polarizing filters. And then it looks wild. But you cross polarizing filters take most of the light out. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. So you have to, you got to pump in a lot of light. I work at the Huntington Library and the Gardens here in us. Uh, Southern yes. California, and uh, I work in the yes, photo the department. Yes, Gutenberg Bible and Blue Boy. Yes, right, right. Blue Boy. Yeah, and um, <laughs> the um, we we sometimes have to use that 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 uh, you know double polarization for some for some of the things that we photograph on occasion, and and the light sucking uh, is no joke. Yeah, it, it. But again, it lets you do something you couldn't do otherwise. Yeah, I think that's cool. Yeah. You, you mentioned that your most recent book was about pizza. What did you learn as what did you learn that you didn't know before as a result of you know well, making this book and especially photographing photographing the uh, the images that you did? So pizza is what I call a poorly documented cuisine. For most kinds of food, you can find some pretty good cookbooks. But pizza has tended to be made by little, at least the best pizza, by little pizzerias or by big chains, but neither one of them want to tell you their secrets. And there's tons of secret recipes. There's tons of mythology where people will say, oh, if you don't have the water of New York City, you'll never make pizza like this. Or if you don't have the water of Naples, or if you don't have, you know, but dum but dum but dum It turns out most of that's just wrong. Um, it's... It, it, but in some in some of the, the cooking that I investigate, there are widespread beliefs that are wrong, but they're kind of innocent. In pizza, often there's a proprietary reason people tell that story mm-hmm. because they want to convince you that you can only go to their pizzeria to get good pizza. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, we were worried it was going to be a little more deceptive. Now, it turned out that once people saw how crazy we were about pizza and for pizza, uh, almost all of the pizza owners were very, very open with us. Uh, but we found lots, even v- professionals believed lots of things that just weren't true. <laughs> and mm. uh, we found, you know, in Italy, there's a weird thing with pizza where they believe that if you use too much yeast in the pizza dough, that it'll give people indigestion. And they would, everyone would say, I use almost no yeast, so my pizza is digestible. I'd say, what, what, what the fuck? I mean, what, 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 what do you mean? <laughs> then they would tell me the, the weirdest things. They would say, like, well, yeast gives you gas because, you know, yeast makes gas. Well, the yeast is dead, okay? It cooks in an oven. It's dead. And so I, then I'd say, well, gee, it must be too bad. If you get indigestion from pizza with yeast, you must not be able to eat bread. And I'd say, oh, no, no, we love Italian bread. And I said, well, guess what? Italian bread has 2% yeast in it. It is 20 times the yeast you're putting in that pizza. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, another thing that was not obvious to most pizzolos is that for most kinds of pizza, it's actually broiling. You're cooking with light. So in a broiler, you've got either flames or electrical elements, and right. they glow. And the way they are co- doing the cooking is that they are putting tons of infrared light down. If you put your hand in there, you figure that out really, really fast. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to touch anything. Right. But the air temperature doesn't matter. Well, it turns out most pizza ovens 
have an open door. Guess what? The reason is they're cooking with light. And mm. the way you know that as a, as a physicist, I would say, is that the higher a temperature uh, something is, the, the greater the proportion of the heat comes out as light. In fact, it goes as the fourth power of temperature. So when you have a pizza oven that's extremely hot, of course it's broiling. But not, I mean, that, 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 that just completely was not understood. And then lots of people said, well, you, I, I don't believe you. Prove it. So we made a piece of stainless steel, like maybe an inch wide, that would sit about an inch above a pizza when it was in the oven. So we'd put the pizza in the oven. We'd mm -hmm. put this thing down. So it would cast a shadow this little strip across the pizza. But there was plenty of air circulation room, so air would get under there. And of course, what happens is the pizza, it would be uncooked across the strip. Uh -huh. But until I showed that, and then we had pictures, but until you have pictures and you have this very simple experiment, people say, oh my God, it casts a shadow? I was like, yeah. That's amazing. Here's another uh, really basic thing. Almost any pizza has puffy rims, and it's thinner in the, the crust is thinner in the center. Mm -hmm. Why? So I just wondered why. Now, of course, you can, if you want to, roll out the pizza thinner in the center. But it turns out most pizza loaves don't. Generally speaking, a pizza goes in the oven. The dough is dead flat across the top. Then you put on the sauce and the right. cheese. Well, the first theory we had was, well, maybe it's the weight of the sauce and the cheese. So we would weigh all of that stuff for one pizza. We'd put two pizzas in the oven. One had the sauce and the cheese. And the other, we'd pour sand on it <laughs> okay. at the same weight. <laughs> not meant to be eaten. Popped right up. No, not ah. meant to be eaten, but it shows the, <laughs> shows the principle. Yeah. It pops right up. And it turns out, here's the, the cut to the chase here. The reason is that the sauce is wet. And water boils at you know, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't matter how hot it is in your pizza. As long as there's any water left in that sauce, it's 212 degrees, period. Uh, yeah. And so what you have done is you've thrown a cold blanket on that center part of your pizza. And that's what keeps the crust from rising. Wow, that, I edge. love that. And so these are examples of things that it's science, it's relevant to the pizza maker, but it's also easy to understand if you take the trouble to explain it and also have some, some simple experiments and, and some good pictures that make it obvious to people. Now, one of the quintessential shots that people want when they're making a picture of pizza is the cheese stretch. Okay, you, you, you get that fresh cut, you're pulling it away, and that cheese is just like, you know, resisting being pulled from the rest of its sliced brethren. So what's the secret to getting a really good cheese stretch that just looks great in the photograph? Well, I mean, there's, there's two simple things and, and one more complicated. So you got to do it right away. It's got to be really hot. You, you can't let it sit or, or the cheese will start to coagulate. Um, I decided I wanted to have the ultimate cheese pull shot. So normally the cheese pull shot is you're pulling up the pizza on this little triangular, you know, spatula pizza server thing, and you're pulling away from the rest of the pizza. Right. So what I did is I got a wide angle macro lens, which is a hard combination. And as we lifted up the slice, I stuck it underneath so the picture shows this shiny spatula as the roof. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's got this walls of cheese dripping yeah. down. <laughs> wow, man. I got to tell you, there are very few interviews that I do that leave me hungry. <laughs> this is definitely one of them. But, you know, if, well, that's one of the kinds of inspiration that I think you should be able to take from food photography. Mm -hmm. You know, if erotic photography is supposed to make you horny or at least bring you into that frame of mind or remind you of that, damn it. Food photography ought to make you hungry. 
Absolutely. maybe not every food photo. I don't want to say they all have to, but certainly look, art is about engaging the viewer and creating this dialogue with the viewer. And that's one of the ways you can do it mm -hmm. <laughs> is to make something that is just ridiculously compelling <laughs> and makes you hungry. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is humans are visual animals, right? I, I'm, I'm super grateful. Uh, dogs really rely more on smell. So whenever they meet each other, they have to sniff each other's butts and <laughs> it's a whole thing. <laughs> it's because we're visual that uh, we're able to get hungry by looking at a picture. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not obvious all animals would. Animals that really were scent oriented would be much, uh, it'd be much more natural for them to smell dinner, which of course we, we can do. The dog smells like a hundred times better than we do, but nevertheless. Yeah. And it's that visual element that makes it so compel photography compelling for us. If we weren't primarily visual animals, I don't think photography would be that much of an art. Yeah, that's very true. That's a great point. Now, obviously, we care about audio also. That's why music can, can be a, a great art as well. But it, it's, I mean, thank God, because no one has found a really good way to do smell rama <laughs> 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 I mean, apart from actually, like, maybe simmering garlic on the stove or something, it, it's you can't reproduce it. And the thing that makes music and photography work is that you take two fundamental ways that humans interact with the world, they, their eyes and ears, and you create a reproducible thing that, uh, that captures that. Yeah. And that's magic. It is. Well, my last question, which I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Well, I think the first thing I would do is I would say, look up the food photos of Edward Weston and Irving Penn. Yeah. Because it's not widely, I mean, everyone's, oh, I've heard of Weston. I know Weston. I've seen his, his nudes and I've seen his landscapes at Point Lobos. And he's got a bunch of food pictures. And so does Penn. You know, Penn is much, tends to be much more known for his fashion work and for a, a variety of other areas. You know, it's funny, uh, there's lots of fundamentally commercial photography like fashion, like celebrity portraits, like architecture. All of those things have a commercial basis. Most architectural photos are taken by somebody hired by the owner or the builder of the building. <laughs> okay? But... People have recognized that an architectural photo can still be art, that fashion photos yeah. can still be art, that uh, you know portraits of famous people can still be art. Uh, we're not quite as far along with the idea that food photos can still be art, but I'm open. <laughs> yeah, you've got several galleries that are you know, showcasing some of your work. You know, we haven't, you haven't touched on that for very long. We can briefly, you know, share something. Sure, well, I... After my cookbooks came out, I had a bunch of people uh, wanting to buy prints. And they'd call up and we'd say, huh, really? So we looked into it and I decided the way to do the, the best way to, to try to, to do that would be to open up some of my own galleries. So I've got uh, four galleries, uh, La Jolla, California, uh, Seattle, New Orleans, and uh, Las Vegas. Although in Las Vegas, we're moving at the moment. And it's been very interesting to see the response. It, it, you know, it's not as traditional for people to buy a food photo for their ho home, for example. Yeah. On the other hand, I say, look, everybody has a dining room. Nobody has a landscape room. So <laughs> why would you only buy landscapes? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a good pitch. <laughs> Well, it was this is these are the first galleries ever dedicated to food photography from a single photographer. And when we started them, I said, Well, maybe we're gonna discover why there aren't any others. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, so far it's going pretty well. Awesome, awesome. Well, man, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. It was so much fun. Okay, well, thank you too. Thanks to Nathan for joining us. 
Find out more about him and his work by visiting ModernistCuisine.com and take a look at his latest release, Modernist Pizza. And remember to check out the Curious Society at CuriousSociety.org. They are building a wonderful community, promoting and supporting exceptional photojournalism and documentary photography. Buy the first issue of their magazine and become a member. And check out their weekly discussion on Tuesday afternoons on the Clubhouse app. Your thoughts and feelings about this show matter. If you haven't already, please write a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever service you use to listen to podcasts. It helps us to stand out among the many thousands of podcasts that are out there. Your voice makes a difference. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or make a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal. We also provide a series of eBooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.